going to sing a song this morning entitled, You Raise Me Up. And uh, if I talk too much about it, I'll cry. But anyway, um, as I sing, I want you to think about all the times, you, uh, maybe some troubled times you've been through that you know the Lord p- raised you up. And um, go ahead. Troubles come and my heart burden be. Then I am still and wait here in silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up. So I can stand on my hands. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. Lord, you raise me up to more than. I can be Than I 
can be You raise me up to more than I can be And thank you Lord for raising me up so many times Amen. Thank you, Miss Mary. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to open them to Colossians. Paul's letter to the church at Colossians. At Colossae, I should say. I want us to be thinking about the church this morning, the body of Christ, and uh, what it means to be part of that. Uh, what God would, uh, would have us to be doing as part of the body of Christ as well. I'm in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 is where I'll begin this morning reading. Uh, Colossians 1.15. If you have found your place in God's Word, I invite you to stand. We stand out of reverence. We stand out of respect for the reading of the Word of God as part of our worship this morning. Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You, Lord, for the privilege of being a part of the church, a part of the body of Christ, the family of God. Lord, we're grateful for the sacrifice that you made that, that made it a, a possible even for us to be here. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for that. And Father, I pray this morning that you might teach us uh, part of the responsibility that we have of being members of the body. Uh, Lord, that you, you have expectations from us and for us. And I pray, God, that you'd show us where we are meeting those. And Lord, I pray you'd make us aware of where we fail. May we leave today, Lord, with a commitment uh, to serve you and to honor you in all that we do. And God, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, you may be seated. Well, you know, anytime you're part of a, of a larger group, even if it's a, a, a family unit, quite frankly, anytime you're part of a group, there's, there's expectations, there's things, responsibilities. Uh, you know, and we, can, we could bring it to the family family group. You know, even, even as children growing up, you, you give your children chores. I mean, you need to. Anyway, so you begin teaching them how to be responsible and, and, and how to uh, learn how to work. And, and there's just things that are expected. You know, we were, uh, our kids were in the band uh, at, at West Morgan. Both of our kids, we were, we were in band for like 14 years. <laughs> well, Tommy, Tommy knows all about that. And, and listen, being a band member at a, at a uh, school that has a good band program, I'll just say it this way, there's a lot of expectations. Uh, we were expected to go to the band parents' meetings. Uh, we were expected to work in the concession stand at uh, football games. We were expected to take our turns parking cars. Uh, that's one of the ways they raise money. Uh, we were expected once a year, they had a big marching competition at West Morgan, and you were expected to be there and part of the workers. It took uh, like 100 people to put that thing on, counting the students. And there's a lot of expectations. It's, it's just things that it's required. Well, there's, it's no different being in the church other than our motivation. Our, our motivation for working in the band was because it was required and in, a, in order for our kids to be uh, part of the program, you know, and, and in good standing, I should say, uh, it was required. But listen, being a part of the church of the living God, there's expectations that, that God has of us, but our motivation is different. We don't do it because it's required. We don't do it in order to check off a box and say, well, I've, I've accomplished that this year. No, 
We do it because we love the Lord, and we do it because we're grateful for what He's done for us, how He's changed our life. Complete different motivation. And so this morning, I want us to think about the church, and I want us to think about uh, the, the expectations God has for us. And I'm not talking about just the preacher or the deacons or the Sunday school teachers. Everybody who is a part of the family of God there's some things God expects of us. And, and, and I find some in this passage of Colossians. We actually are going to look all the way through verse 29. We didn't read it all. It's too much. Uh, but so think with me about what it means to belong to the body of Christ. What does it mean to be part of the church? What does God expect out of us? Well, one of the things I believe that we find in this passage God expects from us is that, that we're to be displaying the majesty of Almighty God. His majesty. Now, think about the majesty of God. What does that mean, the, the, the majesty of God? It, it's this awesome God, this creator God, that all that he has made, that he proves himself that he is above any other king, any other so-called God. He's majestic. And I believe part of our responsibility as a church is to be displaying this. Listen, verse 16 and 17, we read that. says that, for by him all things were created. He is the creator of heaven and earth. No one else did that, only Almighty God. All the stars, the millions of stars, He created them. He knows them by name. Man, there, there's no one else, nothing else like Him. Verse 17, He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. This word consist means all things stand, and that is they are held together. They're held together by this awesome God. The Creator God, how majestic is He? Uh, Peter says that, that, well, let me just read it. Let me read it. Uh, Peter says, For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water uh, and in the water. That is, that the, the, wor the world is standing there. The earth is consistent. It's being held up. It's held together by Almighty God Himself. All these things God deserves our praise for. Everything that we see should, should bring uh, our, our adoration and admiration and, and praise for Almighty God. And the world should see that in us. That's how we display His majesty. We remind people of what He has done, of, of all this creation that belongs to Him. And we do so to one another through our worship together. And I want to see that in just a minute. So listen, we, 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 we tell everybody about our Creator God and how majestic He is. But we also remind them that He is the Redeemer of man's soul. How majestic that the King of all kings, God of the universe, would come and walk on this earth as a man. Give His life on Calvary for the sins of the world. And it, then He would come and He would personally invite me to be a part of his family. And there's no one like that. There's no other God like that. There, there's nothing compares to our God. How majestic. We sing a song, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. And it's our responsibility, our, our privilege, actually, to tell the world how majestic Almighty God is. Verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the head. He's the boss. You see, in my life, you know, my emotion, if I'm not careful, I'll make decisions by emotions. I, I, will, I will get on a, on a tangent and I'll start doing things, not even thinking it through, just because it's something I want to do or I think could be a good thing. And, and then if I ever slow down and start thinking it through and let my head get involved, I thought, oh, that was silly to me to do that. I shouldn't have done, I shouldn't have done that. Well, Christ is the head of the body, and we, we honor Him, and, and we show His majesty by allowing Him to be the boss. He, he makes the decisions in the church. He's the one that leads and guides, and we do what He says. We do what He has told us to do. We follow His directions. And by doing so, we tell the world that He is our King. He is the majestic one, and we gladly follow him. 
And so one of our responsibilities is, is to tell the world, to, to show the world how majestic He is. He's the Creator, but He's also the Redeemer. Look in verse 20. I haven't read that yet. And by Him, uh, okay, let's read 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him were the things on earth, things in heaven, having, been, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Listen, Jesus Christ is reconciling the world to Almighty God. He's bringing things back together. He's, he gives us an opportunity, fallen man, to once again be reconciled to God. It's through His blood. How majestic of a God He is. And we're to be telling the world that. We're to display His majesty in our lives. They should see we are to be a reflection of Almighty God. When other people look at us, they should see Jesus. That's our goal. And part of our responsibility is to display the majesty of, of the King of Kings. How do I do that? By, by worshiping His creation. By worshiping Him, not His creation, worshiping Him for His creation. Let me say it right. By worshiping Him as my Redeemer. By telling the world that He is my King, He is the boss. As the church, we follow His leadership, His guidance. Not what we want to do, not, not what we think is best, but we pray and we follow His direction. And God blesses His church. We're fruitful. And the people say, wow, how are you doing that? It's because of our King. We follow our majesty. We follow the king. And so we display that. We tell others. Look at the latter half of, of verse 20, the end of it. It says that he has, by, uh, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Listen, we tell the world if they want to have peace, if they want peace in their life, then we have the answer. It's the Lord Jesus. Peace. He is the author of peace. He is peace himself. And so we want to tell the world. We want to display his majesty. Tell everybody who he is and, and what he's done for me. I'm not going to be ashamed of him. I'm going to tell them. One of the ways we do it is through worship. Now, I normally don't bring these books with me, but uh, I, I have an illustration. And it's quite lengthy, and I didn't want to have to top it all up. But... I'm not going to read it all either because it is very lengthy. But think about worship. One of the ways we display the majesty of the Lord Jesus is through our worship of Him. How genuine is it? Do you really love Him? Do you really sing to Him? Hear what this says. This is out of a, a book called Worship, Rediscovering the Missing Jewel. What then is the essence of worship? It is the celebration of God. When we worship God, we celebrate Him, we extol Him, we, sing, we sound His praises, we boast in Him, in the Lord Jesus. Now here's what worship is not. This is, I, I couldn't write all this out. Worship is not the casual chatter that occasionally drowns out the organ prelude. Worship is not the mumbling of prayers or the mouthing of hymns with little thought and less heart. Worship is not self-aggrandizing words or boring cliches. When one is asked to give their testimony. Worship is not a grudging gift or compulsory service. We celebrate God when we give to Him and serve Him with integrity. Worship is not haphazard music done poorly. Not even great music done as a performance. We celebrate God when we enjoy and participate music to His glory. Worship is not a distracted endurance of a sermon. Worship is not the hurried motions of a tacked on Lord's Supper. We celebrate God predominantly when we fellowship gratefully at the ceremony. Here's his end. As a thoughtful gift is a celebration of a birthday. As a special evening out is a celebration of an anniversary. A warm eulogy is a celebration of life. As a sexual embrace is a celebration of marriage. So a worship service is a celebration of God. We celebrate, we, we declare to the world the majesty of our God. And one of the ways we do so is through the celebration of worship. And when we have visitors come, people who do not know Jesus, man, they should see our love for the Lord all over this place. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we sing, it ought to be all about Him. 
and pointing people to him because he's worthy. So I believe one of the responsibilities that, that, that God has given us, God has given you as a member of the family of God, is that, that we are to display the majesty of Almighty God in any way that we can through worship and through telling others. Here's something else, though. We're to tell uh, others of the mystery, the mystery of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 24. We didn't get that far reading. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, as of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. Listen, one of the things that we are, are given the responsibility of doing is, is revealing the mystery that God has revealed to us. Now, what is a mystery in Scripture? Is it a whodunit and you finally figure out who done it? No, no, that's not what in Scripture when you're talking about a mystery, it's those things that were hidden previously and, and over the years God has little by little been revealing them. It's a revelation of who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He was the long-awaited king. He is the redeemer of the world. That's the mystery. And we have the privilege of declaring to the world God's mystery. Jesus Christ reconciling the world to himself. He says that it is, verse 27, did I get that far reading? I think, uh, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Here it is which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's the mystery. God Almighty himself would, would come and indwell the very hearts of the believer. That, that when I am born again, when I give my life to Christ, when I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, his Holy Spirit literally indwells me, and He walks with me. He lives with me. I'm able to talk with Him. I'm able to pray to Him. I listen to Him. I hear Him. He, he, he gives me guidance. He gives me comfort. He gives me strength. And on and on and on. I'm to declare to the world this mystery. Friend, are you down and out? Let me tell you something. I have a comforter. He never leaves me. He never abandons me. He's always with me. His name is Jesus. Would you like to meet him? Would you like to get to know this one? Listen, you, are you struggling and you don't know which way to go? Guess what? I have someone in my life that can tell me exactly where to go. He is all powerful, all wise, and he knows all things. His name is Christ Jesus, and he'll help you as well. We're to declare the world the mystery that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. We have that privilege, but we have that responsibility. You see, just coming to church and listening to the sermon is not fulfilling being a church member. Our kids were in the band and, and it was required. It, it wasn't an option. We had to participate. We had to park cars. We had to work in the concession stand. You had to do your share. It was required. Well, God doesn't require it. He doesn't physically make us, but He asks of us to do so. This is our responsibility as children of God to be living displays of the majesty of God, but the mystery of God. Listen, when people look at your life and my life and they think, oh my goodness, how did you turn out so well? Oh, it's just by the grace of God. No telling. Where would I be? Where would you be? We say it all the time. Where would you be had Jesus not come into your heart and life? Listen, you've got brothers and sisters that don't know Christ. Where are they at? You've got cousins that, that are far from the Lord right now. What does their life look like? They might have some money, but what's their family like? Probably falling apart. Probably hate one another. Probably split up, divorced, separated. I mean, you just go on and on and on. Where would I be without Jesus? And I can tell the world, here's the mystery. 
Here's the, here's the secret to my success. <laughs> it is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. In Revelation, the Bible tells me this, Revelation 3.20. Now, I know he writes this to the church, okay? So don't correct me, but, but let's learn something. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And I will sup with them and dine with them. Now, Jesus writes that to the church in Revelation. I realize that. But there's some lessons there, though. One of those is this. God doesn't force himself into his church or into your life. He's on the outside and he's, he's knocking. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to be a part of your neighbor's life, of your cousin's life, your brother or sister who doesn't know him. He's there knocking, but he will not force himself in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, the first thing that that person has to do is they have to hear and recognize and believe that Almighty God is speaking to them. And what he's telling them is, listen, you need a Savior. You are a sinner bound by sin, and there's no hope for you other than Jesus. That's what he's telling them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, there's the key. You've got to hear it, and you have to open that door. Part of your testimony, part of, of, of what you can tell people as they ask you, why is it you always have a, a pep in your step? Why is it you always have a smile on your face? Why is it you never worry about things? Why is all that? Well, here's why. Because one day in my life, I, I was distraught. I was on my way. Who knows where? But, but the Lord Jesus came and he spoke to my heart. He, he knocked on my heart's door. And I heard it for the very first time. I recognized that it was Almighty God, the creator of the universe, Speaking to my little heart. And he told me that he loved me. That he died on the cross for me. And he told me that if I would but turn from my sin and turn to him and receive him as Lord of my life. He would enter into my heart. He would come in and dine with me and fellowship with me. And I would have an eternal home in heaven. And I did that. I remember the day I did that. I, I confessed my sin. The burden was lifted from my heart. And now Jesus abides with me. See, I, I have the responsibility of declaring the majesty of Jesus, but the mystery. Here's the mystery. Here's the secret to peace, joy, hope, happiness, eternal life. Jesus Christ indwelling your heart. Jesus Christ living within you. Paul says in 1 Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Our hope. He is our hope. I brought a hymn book up today because I, I love our hymns. Hymn 511. Probably, Tommy probably already knows what it is. The Solid Rock. Listen to the first verse. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You see, we have the privilege, but we have the responsibility of declaring to a world what the mystery of God is. The mystery of God is there's but one way, one way. There's no other way but one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament began revealing to us man could not save himself. Man was not good enough. The blood of bulls and goats would not cover the sins of the world. And therefore, the Gospels tell us God sent His only Son, Jesus, to pay my penalty. You see, it's been revealed. It's a mystery that's now been revealed. And we have the responsibility to declare it to the world. We're, we're to be telling people. And it's not just the professionals. Everybody, every single person who is part of the family of God has this responsibility. I worship Him and declare His majesty. I live faithfully for Him. And every opportunity I get, I tell of the mystery of Almighty God. But listen, there's a third thing that you have been given, that I've been given. It's, it's, it's found in these scriptures. And, and we are to do the ministry of the church. 
We declare His majesty. We, we reveal the mystery. But we also do ministry, serving Almighty God through the body of, of Christ. Look at verse 28 and 29. Paul speaking, Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect or mature or complete in Christ Jesus. To this end I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Listen, Paul says, part of my responsibility is to do the ministry that I've been given a stewardship. He uses the word stewardship in verse 25. He said, listen, I've been given a stewardship. And that is, I, I've been given this, this gift, and I am to, to be a steward of it. I'm to share it, and I'm to dis disperse it, using it wisely. I, I've been given a stewardship to, to tell other people about Christ, and, and, and he gives me how to do it. He gives me a couple of things here. He says, listen, uh, here's what God is asking of me to do. He says, reach the world in verse 27. Reach the world. Verse 27, he says, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the, uh, among the Gentiles. He says, listen, God has given, he's willed that we make known to all people this mystery. That's, that's our, our ministry. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The, the, reaching the world with the message that, that Christ is the answer. He is the only hope. Now we know the Great Commission, Matthew 28. We, we know that, that, that we have been summoned. We have been called to go and tell all the world. That's our commission. That's our stewardship. We're to reach the world. That, that's, what, that's what God expects of the church to do. And I'm to do my part. Whether it's giving to Lottie Moon, whether it's praying for my missionaries, whether it's going on, on mission trips. And you know what? A mission trip could be simply going across the street to your neighbor's house. That could be a mission trip. But I'm to be on mission. That, that's, that's what God is, that's the ministry He's given me. Jesus Christ the head what has come to reconcile the world unto himself. He makes the decisions. His decision is, church, I want you to go and make disciples. Reconcile the world. You see, the Lord Jesus was an extension of, uh, of Almighty God, if you will. God himself came and walked on this earth. And he revealed to us what God is like. God is love. God is compassionate. God is, is all-powerful. We see that in the life of Jesus. Now Jesus has gone back to God the Father, and He has left the church to be His extension. Now He loves people through us. He lives through us. He does His ministry through us. And His ministry has not changed. He still died for all people. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so we have a responsibility of, of sharing the mystery of Christ with the world, however we can do that. Guess what? God's bringing the world to us. Man, we've got so many nationalities in the United States now. And these people come and they go to school here and then they go back home. And if we win them for Christ, they take the gospel back with them. We have a ministry of reaching the world. We have a ministry, though, of preaching the word. The Word of God, verse 28, very, very, very clear. He says, Him we preach. We warn every man, we teach every man, that we may present every man complete in Christ Jesus. Listen, we are, we are called to, to preach the Word. You say, well, I'm not a preacher, so that gets me out of it. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. It's proclaiming the Gospel. You can do it through lifestyle. You do it through your worship here every Sunday. But you also do it by opening your mouth and telling people your testimony. What has Jesus done in your life? Because our excuse is, well, you know, I can't remember a lot of verses of Scripture. I don't know the Roman road. and I, I can't witness. Yes, you can. If you are a born-again child of God, you have a story. Tell them your story. That's all you have to do. You tell them your story and let God do the rest. Tell them your story. Tell them what God has done for you, how He's changed your life. I want to ask you to turn in the book of Acts. I have one more verse of Scripture I want us to look at. Acts 26. Uh, one more passage. 
Uh, I, I'm reading Oswald Chambers this year as my devotion. Uh, you know, I've been doing Henry Blackaby last year, and, uh, and I was tempted to do Henry Blackaby again. I love Blackaby. Uh, but I'm trying Oswald Chambers, and, and Oswald Chambers is very deep sometimes. He, that's one of the reasons I've not done Oswald Chambers. He's too deep for me. Uh, but Oswald Chambers, uh, Acts 26, verse 17. Oswald Chambers says, this is the, the, the Christian workers' marching orders. This is what we're to be doing. Verse 20, whoop, verse 17. Y'all yeah, mess up. Verse 17, I will, deliver you, uh, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Here's, here's the, the message. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and notice this, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and, inher and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, this is Jesus talking to Paul. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn their eyes from the darkness to the light. How do I turn someone's eyes from darkness to light? I, I, I go before them and I tell them what God has done for me. I tell them my story and I tell them, listen, if you're tired of living this way. If you're tired of being an alcoholic, if you're tired of your family being in uproar constantly, then I have an answer for you. And His name is Jesus. And you turn them from looking at the darkness, you turn them to the light of God. Now they're not saved. They're, they're not saved just because they look and say, oh, I think I'll consider this. Notice what he says. As he goes on there, he says, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. You know, who has, you know who belongs to the family of God? You know who are Christians, real Christians? Those who have had their sins forgiven, washed away by the blood of Jesus. It's not a bunch of head knowledge. It's not coming to church. It's not participating in, in, in cantatas. It's none of those things. Have your sins been forgiven? Have they been washed away? By the blood of the Lamb. See, that's, that's our commission. That's what we are called to do. We're to go and turn people from darkness and let them look at Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. I don't have to talk people into giving their life to Jesus. All I have to do is tell them what He's done for me. Invite them to give Him a chance. Turn, look and see what this King can do for you. Let them look, and the Spirit of God will do the work. And they will find forgiveness of their sins in Jesus. A Christian is not someone who is a member of a church. Now, you may be a Christian and a member of the church, but just because you're a member of a church does not mean you're God's child. Have you had your sins forgiven? How does that happen? I confess to the Lord Jesus, God, I, uh, I confess to you I am a sinner. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. God, I confess to you that I absolutely cannot save myself. There is nothing I can do. I am not worthy. But I believe Jesus died for my sins. And God, I'm asking you right now to forgive me of my sins. And in turn, Father, I will live for you the rest of my days. Lord of my life from this point on. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had your sins forgiven? Forgiven. Washed away. We are part of the family of God, the church of the living God. Listen, Paul says my goal uh, back over in, in Colossians is to, make, is to reach every man and bring them to this point of being complete in Christ Jesus. Every person. That's in, I'm back in Colossians 1, 20, uh, 28. That's the goal. That's what God has asked us. We've been given this, this stewardship, this responsibility. You know, in the parables, God, Jesus gives us a parable of, of, of stewardship. And he talks about those who were given uh, talents. And, and the master leaves. And then when he comes back, everyone is accountable, held accountable. One was given one talent, one five and one ten. And every one of them had to give an account of what they of their stewardship. What did they do with, with the blessings God had blessed them with? 
Well, Paul is telling us here that that's, that's the church. We've been blessed. We, we have been given a stewardship. We are the arms and legs of the Lord Jesus. What does God expect of us? What, what does that mean for us? Well, I believe it means at least three things, probably more. But number one is I, I'm to declare the majesty. I am to worship Him with all of my heart. And friend, if you've never been forgiven of your sins, you can't do that. You might sing, but it's not going to come from your heart. It's not going to be genuine worship. It's just, it's just going through the motions. But if you know for sure, here's where I was, and Jesus has changed my life, and here's where I am now, and, and here's where I'm going. Man, you can worship. You can sing praises to Him. You can sing with a heart that is absolutely thrilled with Jesus. Is that where you're at? I hope so. If not, why aren't you there? Is it because you've never been forgiven or is it because you've just, you have something that's preventing you from surrendering totally? You've, not, you, you've got a sin. You've got a, a pride issue. There's something going on that will not allow you to do what God expects you to do, and that's declare His majesty. You need to deal with that today. What about the mystery? God expects us to reveal the mystery to the world. What is the mystery? It is Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. The only hope of a lost world, Jesus Christ in me. He must be living within your heart. It's a relationship. I know Him. He knows me. And one day I will not hear Him say, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. In fact, what I will hear him say is, well done, good and faithful servant. I did know you. I had a relationship with you. The mystery. But also he expects the church, his people, to be doing ministry. Reaching the world, teaching and preaching the word. In your life, in my life. That's our focus. There are people that do not know Christ. How can we introduce them? I mean, it's that, it's that simple. It's, how can we introduce them to Jesus? How can we turn them from focusing on darkness and at least looking into the light and let the Spirit of God deal with them? How do we do that? That's what God's asked us to do. So let me ask you, are you being a faithful steward with what God has given to you? God has given you a, a testimony. If you're His child, you have a story that you can tell. Are you telling it? Are you being faithful and worshiping Him? And, and, and coming to church excited because we're going to sing praises to the King and we're going to tell Him through song how much we love Him. If not, then confess that and say, Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm not there. God, show me why. Show me why I'm not there. I want to, to, be, to declare your majesty. Help me, God. Lord, help me declare the mystery. And Lord, help me be faithful to the ministry that you've called me. I'm going to ask you to stand. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to pray with you and pray for you this morning. Pray for all of us. The number one, we are truly in the church. We are part of the family of God. And if not, you'll take care of that today. But number two, that we as a church will fulfill your calling, God's calling. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we're so grateful to know you. God, you're so good to us. And Lord, how can we not gather in worship? How can we not sing praises to you when we think of all that you've done for us? Uh, Lord, we need this time. We go through all week in the midst of lost people people who are sad and broken and hurt. And Lord, we need to come back on Sundays and just and spend time with you and be reminded of, of who we serve and, and the power that's available. Lord, we need that. And I pray, God, that we gather and worship you with hearts full of love. God, I thank you for revealing the mystery to us. And Lord, help us through our ministry to reveal that mystery to other people. Lord, lay someone upon our hearts. Give us that one person that we can be praying for this year. 
that one person that I can be, can be a friend to, a witness to. And Lord, help every one of us be faithful to tell our story. That's all you ask, our testimony. Tell our story. Turn them from the darkness to the light. Lord, have your will and way, I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.